Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our latest webinar. Good to see you, and I hope you've all got some lovely sunny weather. It's certainly gorgeous here. So I am joined today by Ellis White, who's going to be presenting our webinar. My name is Catherine Metters, and I'm going to be anchoring the session. So I'm going to be introducing um, Ellis and also going to be putting the questions to her at the end of the session. So if you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A and I will go through at the end and get through as many of them as I possibly can. I'd like to reassure you that we are recording this webinar. So if you have any technical problems or you need to leave, the recording will be available on our website as long as, as also with a PDF of the slides. So really, I think I just need to introduce you to Ellis. She's an accredited business psychologist with a master's degree in psychology and further training in counselling and education. Ellis is the founder of Mindset Mental Health, a principal practitioner of the Association of Business, business Psychologists and a graduate member of the British Psychological Society. So exceedingly well placed, I think, to talk to us today about reduce stress and thrive whilst working from home. So Ellis, without further ado, over to yourself. Good morning. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so yes, my name is Ellis. Good morning from sunny Hertfordshire. Um, and, and as she has said, I'm a business psychologist. So business psychology is a field dedicated to improving the quality of working lives. And something that is essential to that is employee mental health. If you do have any questions, um, do not hesitate to drop them in the Q&A. And today we'll be talking about stress, learning about what it is and how it affects us both physically, emotionally and at work. And then we'll discuss how we can effectively reduce stress both in and out of the workplace and thrive. So stress is our body's response to pressure and many different situations or life events can cause stress. And you can see examples of which here. It's often triggered when we experience new things uh, or something unexpected, uh, unexpected that threatens our sense of self. And particularly when we feel that we have very little control over a situation. In the workplace, it often occurs when we have expectations to perform well in a situation or having a great deal of demands placed on you. And we'll all deal with stress differently. What stresses me out might not stress you out and vice versa. So our ability to cope can depend on different things, particularly things like early life events, personalities, social and economic circumstances. A number of things can impact how we cope with stress. But it is actually um, a normal biological reaction to something we see as threat or danger. So when you encounter stress, your brain floods your body with chemicals and hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. So what happens when we experience this? Well, it makes us warmer so that we can prepare to run from any danger. It reduces, uh, releases glucose and that is for your energy and for your cells to have that energy. So our body then raises our blood pressure and our heart rate to try and deliver that glucose around the body. Our digestion is inhibited to save energy. Our reproduction is slowed. Our immunity is inhibited. Growth and tissue repair is stopped. Pain is stunted. Senses sharpen and then certain survival aspects of our memory start to improve. Now, back in the early days of humankind, the stressful circumstances that we faced were things like saber toothed tigers. And when we're faced with them, we had two options. You either fight or you run away. So that's how we've come to know the fight or flight response. And all of those hormones on nature's way of preparing you to face that danger and increase your chance of survival. And when fighting or running, that physical response burns off the chemicals, lowers our blood pressure and our body will start to return to normal. But today's stressful situations now don't demand the fight or flight response. And in actual, actual fact, many cases, it could get us in a lot of trouble because we can't kill our managers, we can't run away from parking tickets. 
And our body isn't that well equipped for the 21st century because we still have the same fight or flight response that we did before. Our body releases those chemicals and now we're not burning them off as efficiently. So too much stress with no coping strategies can actually have negative impacts on your long, your long term health which is why stress is actually known now as a bit of a silent killer, because over time it can lead to premature death. So it's really important that we recognise and respond to stress because it can help you live longer. Now, I asked you uh, a very simple question earlier of, uh, you know, is stress good for us? And I hear a lot of people say stress is good for us or it's just part and parcel of life. And some people do believe that, that stress makes them perform better. However, science shows that is rarely true. Research consistently shows the exact opposite. And usually stress causes a person to make more mistakes and has dramatic negative impacts on our health and well-being. Even mild stress can actually cause us to lack the ability to keep our cool. It makes it more difficult for us to control our emotions, making us a bit more snappy. It's also linked to illnesses and diseases such as cancer, psoriasis of the liver. Um, it impacts our ability to connect with others, so it affects your love life. Um, and some people actually grind their teeth quite unconsciously when they're stressed, so it can actually cause dental problems wearing your teeth thin. And because of those changes in the body we mentioned earlier, particularly the ones in the cardiovascular system where you've got higher blood pressure and uh, faster heart rate, that actually forces your heart to work harder and that will increase your rate of things like heart attacks and coronary artery disease. And the temptation to eat, drink and smoke is up to 40% more. It also contributes to slower cell growth, as we saw, and that will then increase our signs of aging. So wrinkles, poor eyesight, weak muscles, all of that um, contributes to the sign of premature aging. And because of the high demands on the body, it makes us so vulnerable to things like colds, blood pressure, higher blood pressure, stroke, angina, and that can lead to long term disabilities. And finally, it can actually increase your chances of poor mental health, um, particularly conditions such as anxiety, depression and psychosis. So I'm actually quite concerned that by not recognising the impact of stress, we can almost encourage it. We need to stop talking about stress as if it's a good thing or at least not recognise that it's not a bad thing, because a culture that ignores, dismisses or encourages stress can be quite dangerous because it will lead to burnout company wide, organisation wide, culture wide and also major consequences to our health and well-being. So my first tip to um, reduce stress and thrive is to change your mindset and recognise the negative impact that stress has on our health, well-being and our workplace. Now, one theory to consider how we cope with stress now is known as the stress bucket. And that's a concept that suggests that we all have a stress container and stresses flow into it and we carry them around with us but too much stress and that container will overflow, causing us to feel quite overwhelmed, emotionally and physically exhausted and developing those negative behaviours that we're more aware of, such as anger, aggression, avoidance, tearfulness. And millions of us in the UK experience high levels of stress and it is damaging to our health. About 74% of adults have felt so stressed at some point that they feel overwhelmed or unable to cope. And stress is known now as one of the great public health challenges of our time, but it's still not really taken as seriously as physical health concerns, even though almost 18 million working days are lost each year due to work-related stress, anxiety and depression. So individually, we need to understand what is causing us our stress and learn from that what steps we can take to reduce it for ourselves 
and those around us. Often the most stressful factor in people's lives is work um, and also finances, debt and financial problems or health. So we do need to start changing at a societal level. Um, and that includes ensuring that employers treat stress with mental health concerns as seriously as physical safety. And one reason to do this is because one in five people take a day off sick because of stress, but 90% of people actually cite a different reason for their absence. Now, remember everyone has stresses in their life and we do respond differently to them. What stresses me out might not stress you and vice versa, as I said. But now you know not to ignore those stresses, it's time to recognise them and consider how to address them. So after this webinar, we're going to send you an email post webinar with some signposts and some helpful resources to organisations that um, can potentially help. And I do recommend if you have an employee assistance programme to use that resource as well. So I now have a question for you before I put my next slide up. Um, why do we brush our teeth? That might sound like a really random question, but I promise I've got a point. Why do we brush our teeth? There's a number of reasons that we brush our teeth twice a day. Why do we do so? Can you get to the chat box and type your answers? Fantastic. To keep them healthy. Habit. Yeah. Personal hygiene. Absolutely. Oh, to reduce tooth decay. Yeah. Fantastic. Preventative. Makes the breath smell good self-hygiene, keep them as long as possible, safe teeth. Absolutely. Fantastic. So you've all got fantastic answers. It, it tastes nice. It prevents the smell. It's good health practice because it avoids that tooth decay, keeps them white because it can um, be good. It does prevent heart disease as well. Well done. Good gums as well. I don't know if anyone's mentioned gums. Um, but brushing your teeth is really important for dental hygiene, right? We all know that. Um, and a lot of you've mentioned that it's something that's ingrained in us. We've been encouraged to do this for, for, for almost all of our lives. And this small self-care component is essential for maintaining dental health. And when we don't do it consistently, eventually we will need to go to a dentist or a healthcare practitioner to get support. OK. Now, imagine if we all viewed our mental health in a similar way, because our mental health is similar. We need to have good self-care habits to try and protect and prevent negative outcomes. So, in fact, this does actually go beyond mental health. But you could say in terms of your overall well-being, self-care is proven to be essential for maintaining health and well-being. It helps us be our most productive, energetic and all round best versions of ourselves. However, many people view self-care as a luxury, particularly when we're talking about mental health and well-being. They view it as a luxury rather than a priority. And consequently, this can leave people feeling overwhelmed, tired, ill-equipped, to handle life's inevitable challenges because our stress buckets are constantly full. And if you're burning the candle at both ends, so to speak, then that will come with those significant consequences. Burnout, depression, anxiety, resentment, um, a whole host of negative implications. So engaging in a self-care routine is important and it's actually clinically, uh, clinically proven to reduce poor mental health for example, stress, anxiety and depression. Um, it helps improve your concentration, uh, increase happiness, improves your energy. And even from a physical health perspective, it's been clinically proven to reduce heart disease, stroke and cancer. So going back to the stress bucket theory, that is what the tap is on that image there. OK, the more helpful coping strategies and self-care that we do, the more we can release the stress in our stress buckets in our lives and hopefully maintain better well-being and potentially be a preventative strategy, meaning that we might not necessarily need support further down the line. So there's a few things that you can do to help reduce the cortisol, those stress hormones and 
that are known as being effective in promoting well-being and your resilience to stress. And there are a few examples on the board here, and this by no means is not an exhaustive list. OK, and there are some things on there that you think I love doing those and there might be others that you think that's not me. And that is absolutely OK as well. It's it's encouraged that you take a person centred approach here. The one that I will mention and is the one in bold is exercise. OK, if we go back to my exp uh, explanation of, of how stress impacts us, um, that fight or flight is a very physical response that our brain is kind of expecting. So it is known as one of the most effective ways as to combating stress is to use exercise. So you have the stressor, we expect a physical response, and then that physical response burns off the chemicals, lowers our blood pressure, and our body will return to normal. So having a physical response can actually be the quickest way to reduce stress. But it doesn't have to be anything overly exhausting. Even a 10 minute brisk walk, stretching, muscle relaxation techniques, dancing, whatever you're most comfortable with. In fact, before this webinar, I was actually sat at my desk doing little movements like this to try and reduce my stress because obviously public speaking, a well known trigger for causing stress. And so um, my physical response was to sit and move my arms until I felt a bit more comfortable. So that physical response can be a, a quick way to reduce in stress, um, but it isn't a one size fits all strategy. So we, we all have different needs and lifestyles that need accommodating. Um, and I encourage you to think about what you can do to improve your self care because everybody needs a self care plan, but it needs to accommodate your life. A self-care plan for a busy student who's mentally stimulated all the time and has a busy social life might need to emphasise more physical self-care. Um, a single working mother might need to incorporate more social self-care to make sure their social needs are being met. Uh, busy professionals might need to exercise setting those work-life boundaries, turning off their notifications, not working past working hours. So it's not a one size fits all strategy. Have a think about what you can do. OK, what what's your self-care strategy? Do you do self-care regularly? Can you prioritize it more? So for me, I quite like working from home. I can't say that I miss commuting into London or driving around the country, um, but I do struggle to be motivated, productive and focused throughout the day. And working from home in particular means there's a lot more distractions and easy to slip up on bad habits. Um, so here's a few of my top tips for working from home and known to reduce stress. First and foremost, maintain a consistent routine. Um, what do you do before work usually? Uh, for me, I'm up at seven, shower, dress, and if I was going to work, then I would drive and listen to the radio. Um, and I try and do just that when I'm working from home, minus the drive. I start work at the same time. I take breaks and I finish at the same time as best as I can. We are creatures of habit, so we need to maintain routine as best as we can. Then you need to choose a work from home office and stick with it. I personally used to be quite bad working from bed, OK, but comfort costs productivity and sleep. It is well proven that if you work on a comfortable sofa or in bed, that you're not actually as productive as you would be sitting at a desk or a dining room table. So if you don't have a dedicated workspace, um, it can be difficult to focus and switch off at the end of the day as well. So try and work from the same place. Um, and if you need equipment to help you do that comfortably, uh, I recommend that you do talk to your employers because some have been able to provide the additional work from home equipment uh, to help you feel more comfortable at home. 
My third tip, stay connected. It can be really lonely working from home, uh, particularly for those of us that, that live alone, particularly um, if you rely on work to socialise, um, it can be really difficult to not have the office chatter uh, to connect with others and, and, and stay, stay socially connected. So let's all make an effort to stay more socially connected and check in with each other. Make tea break Zoom calls or post lunch work G meets if you need to, you know, whatever video conferencing software that you use, because it is nice to be together. And try not to just have the social time in meetings. Try and have breaks and lunch breaks or catch ups that don't necessarily revolve around work. Fourthly, uh, it's important and vital to set boundaries, particularly those people working from home tend to spend longer hours working. Essex University found that people were more likely to work about 30% more of their total hours each week when they work from home. And this can lead to a number of well-being concerns, such as things like burnout and stress. So when the working day is done, we need to set those boundaries. We need to switch off, put the office away, leave it to the next working day. You deserve a break. So as best as you can, set those boundaries and switch off. And finally, there is such a thing called a wellbeing action plan. Um, MIND, the UK's leading mental health charity, have done a fantastic wellbeing action plan that I really recommend. It's an easy, practical way to help you support your own mental health. And if you're a manager, allowing you to support the mental health of other team members. They have three different plans. One is for an employee. One is for a manager supporting an employee and another one has been specifically designed for when you're working from home. And anyone can complete these wellness action plans. You don't have to have a mental health concern to do one or feel the benefits. Um, and having a plan just means that you consider some practical steps in how to make sure you're supported when you're not feeling your best. So again, um, wellbeing action plans will be sent to you or a link to them will be sent to you post webinar as well. And thank you for the comment. WAPs are really helpful. We're rolling them out in Lancashire County Council. Fantastic. So working from home can be better for productivity in some cases, but don't let it come to a cost of your work life balance. Spend a bit of time making a plan of how you want to work and what's best for you and set those good boundaries. So an example of what I do, I still get up at seven, I get myself a cup of tea, I feed the dog and I know for my productivity I need a routine. So I've actually realised that staying in bed later when I work from home doesn't work for me at all. I need to get up at the same time each day. I then find it quite helpful to spend 10 minutes stretching before I sit down because it makes me feel a bit more motivated to start the day. I've set myself up a desk so that I always use the same place and I've got the right equipment to make it comfortable so I'm not left feeling sore or uncomfortable by the end of the day. And I personally um, believe in agile working hours. I take a two hour lunch break so that I can walk the dog. I've got an English Springer Spaniel, so he needs a lot of a uh, lot of energy. And um, taking that two hour lunch break enables me to walk him, take that break, and I make up the time later on in the day. I don't check emails at, um, outside of working hours. And I also don't do any housework, um, chores, life admin or anything like that is for outside of working hours. Because um, I find that if I do both work and home things, I feel a lot more overwhelmed by the end of my day. Um, and I also have regular meetings with colleagues where I catch up. I think one of my colleagues is here um, watching today and we catch up every Friday. Um, and sometimes we leave those in, even if there's nothing much to speak about. Um, so 
So it's um, nice to leave those in and, and regardless, if there's no work to discuss, you've still got that social time. OK, so that's an example of the kind of habits that, that I've I've built. Um, and yes, I'm glad to see that many of you agree that the dogs are happy working from home and um, it can be helpful to, to our well-being for sure. Um, so employees who are experiencing work related stress. Um, it will lead to lower productivity, loss of work days, higher turnovers in staff for the organisation. And if you're a manager, a supervisor or an employer, you can help lower workplace stress. And the first step is to act as a positive role model. If you um, look at the research, there are five main causes of workplace stress. Um, firstly, is factors intrinsic to the job. So things like your working hours, um, conditions of work, what you do for a living. It can be the demands of the role, including your responsibilities, managing conflicts, um, complaint handling, those sorts of demands. It can be career development or the lack of opportunities for promotions or lack of job security. Relationships come into play here as well, um, particularly discrimination, personality clashes, issues with organisational conflicts. And finally, the organisation structure as well, lack of processes, uh, financial instability, not being involved in making decisions or feeling like you, you aren't valued uh, as part of your organisation. So improving a workplace isn't something I can possibly cover in a short webinar such as this one, nor is it a one size fits all approach. Um, so please do get in touch if you want more information about addressing company culture or organisational wide culture. But there are some ideas and ways to reduce stress in and out of the workplace that I would recommend that you can do as an individual and also as teams or managers. And one of those most popular supportive strategies is mental health first aid um, or MHFA. It's also known as the highest return of investment. Deloitte had done a piece of research and realised that um, the return of investment is about 14 to 1 if you have a mental health first aid team in your organisation. So mental health first aid is the primary assistance given to someone experiencing poor mental health, but they are absolutely not there to be ongoing counsellors or replace professional help. They are simply there to be able to recognise when somebody might be needing support, to have a conversation and to signpost them to effective services. And they can be really helpful to help you understand how to promote your own well-being. And although it is an excellent supportive strategy, it has to be used in addition to other strategies. So please talk to us if you're interested in mental health first aid training. But the biggest problem I see in terms of stress from a whole organisational perspective is that they don't have a number of varied supportive strategies in place. So people end up burning out from not having the right support or tools at work. So to address this, businesses need to evaluate the organisation as a whole and address stress and try and prevent it from the source, not leaving HR or mental health first aid teams to firefight and support mental health when it's already been sparked. So 76% of workers believe their company should be doing more to protect the mental health of their workforce. Um, my final tip is that businesses as a whole need to create a wellbeing strategy at work, not that, that not only supports people that are already experiencing poor mental health, but also a way to prevent poor mental health and promote good wellbeing. And these can be through a number of different things like training, mental health first aid, policy, regular evaluation, but it has to be something that is addressed as a case by case. Um, so if you have any questions about that, please do get in touch. 
So I hope that you found my top tips helpful. Um, I'd like to invite the questions now. And a few questions were sent through before we started. Um, so should we start with those, Catherine, and then get to the Q&A? I think we will. I have to say, I've been um, scribbling down various things, you know, agreeing with some things and going, oh, I've forgotten about that. So thank you um, <laughs> for, for reminding me about looking after myself. I think we all need to do that. So yes, Thank we're starting you. with um, some of the ones that came through in advance, although I think you've covered quite a lot of them. But um, first one is, you know, what in your opinion is the single most important way we can support home working from colleagues for who are suffering from stress? Top tip there. Top tip. I do find the wellness action plans really beneficial and I would like it to be something that you do as soon as possible, not waiting for someone to become unwell, but actually doing it early on. And so I would invite people to create these wellness action plans for themselves um, and, and do it for everybody so that you're never singling somebody out. And then that, that that's one of the op options that you can support uh, a better culture overall when it comes to workplace wellbeing and stress. I think that that almost sort of answers the next question, which was, you know, how do we best reach out to, to stop people suffering in silence? Well, if we proactively viewing, you know, um, wellness plans, then actually you're already halfway there, aren't you? So I think I think that's a that's a really good one to do. Exactly. Um, I, I just want to add that, um, you know, remember that we're not all the same. So it's quite difficult to necessarily say this one thing is amazing, which is why I've gone for the well, wellness action plan because it's very person centered and that's the most effective thing you can do is find out what that individual needs and what is going on in their life. So that second part of the question, I would say, you know, how best to reach out to colleagues is ask, you know, how are you doing? I've noticed you've not been yourself recently and I wanted to check in and see how you're doing. Yeah, and I think again, that leads on very nicely to, to the next question is that the best way to convey to, to staff this is that it is positive to report difficulties with handling adverse stress levels and not feeling judged. I mean, okay, we were talking work. I mean, there's society here too, but I, I'd be interested in, in your, your, your view really on, on that one. This is a really good question that I would find quite difficult to answer in a very short, succinct way, because workplaces are very different. What I would do to support a hospital is very different to a primary school, is very different to a small business with 25 employees or a dentist. Do you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's something that is quite difficult to, to talk about um in in general terms um so i would like to say that it's important to serve i would say that one of the best things that you can do is engagement surveys okay and i know sometimes as an employee they can feel really annoying if you get lots of surveys but you know these are your opportunity to to share how you're truly feeling um, and I found that staff surveys can really highlight certain in needs that would provide the best support. So if there's a cultural concern, then ask your employees directly, invite them to give feedback and take that seriously. And um, that will give you a, a, the most succinct way to, to support your staff. It's really starting that conversation, isn't it? And, and I think a staff survey is a really good way to say, actually, we're starting to take this seriously, isn't it? So, yeah. Absolutely. We've got a couple coming in. This is an interesting one. Is the link to cirrhosis of the liver linked to the stress itself or to the increased likelihood of increased alcohol intake? Um, good question. That one would be entirely dependent on lifestyle factors. So I can't actually say yes it's to do with alcohol increase um, because it's not always necessarily due to that and there are other things in life that can cause psoriasis of the liver uh, cirrhosis of the liver um, and so um, it'd be difficult to give a generalizing answer for that because um, it, it would need to be considered on a case by case okay that's great that's a good question there's an interesting one here um, on managing stress lists were noted 
I thought this could add to stress as you see things that aren't getting done, um, usually due to more tasks coming in. And then there's a comment that I understand that a list of one is preferable, that is achievable, then when one is done, you can write down the next. Any thoughts on, on lists or is it a very much a personal thing? Yeah, it is quite a personal thing. Um, I completely agree. And that sometimes if you've got a list as long as your arm, it can almost make you feel more overwhelmed. Um, and remember that we all cope with things differently. So some people might find that lists actually isn't for them and that other people might think I actually find it quite helpful to get everything that I'm thinking out on paper so that it's not whirling around my head and I struggle to remember what I need to do. And sometimes they find it easier to prioritise those three. So someone's already said they've brainstormed and picked three. That's it. And others are saying they find it satisfying. Yes, I agree with using Gantt charts as long as you're quite comfortable mm -hmm. with the technology of those. I personally use a, a software as well. Um, but yeah, remember that although that list um, had some general ideas, there are going to be things on there that some people enjoy, some people don't. An example that I often give is that I love long, hot bubble baths. But I know a lot of people that think that sitting in a bath is like sitting in your own filth and they hate it. So, you know, it's, it, I'm not saying that this is the right answer for everyone, but there are some general ideas. So take into your own consideration what it is that you enjoy and, and how you would feel doing those things. I have to say, I mean, I, I love my lists, as, as a lot of people do in the, in the <laughs> chat, but I actually prioritise my lists. Um, and so there and some of them are, are sort of are almost lo, life goals as well. So I price it, but there's nothing better than mm. crossing something off a list. Love it. Mm. love it. So now we've got one down here. How would you recommend getting out of a stress cycle? E.g. know that you are stressed um, and then you're very conscious of the negative effect it has on you, causing further stress so is there any tips if you know yourself that you're feeling you're going a bit down a rabbit hole maybe any 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 tips there mm -hmm. my first answer to that is to never worry about getting professional help okay mm -hmm. um because I'd be concerned if I gave a, an example of things to do I don't know quite how severe the stress cycle is or how much it's impacting your day-to-day -day life so I would really encourage you to consider getting support for it um, and whether or not that's through an EAP or charity um, or, or, um, or professional support from your NHS or private so you know please do feel confident to get that support. Um, some other things that you can try is to consider what those stresses are and if there's anything that that we can do to combat those stresses um you know there's a stress bucket exercise which um i believe is available online where you write inside the bucket things that you are feeling stressed about and then there are questions where you can where it kind of challenges them and says is there any support that i can get for these stresses are there things there that i can do to help myself are there things that other people can do to help me and it helps you break down some of those stresses. Um, that is a, a kind of counselling technique that um, is, is uh, really widely used. So I would maybe have a think about understanding the stresses in your life and, and what you could potentially do to support them. But professional help is, is, is really valuable when you find that you're struggling to move out of a stressful cycle. I think just really important, just just reach out, isn't it? You no, know, don't yeah. don't take it all on yourself. Reach out to whatever is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a really interesting one next. How do you get managers to engage when they don't feel there's a problem in their team? Oh, good question. Oh, golden question, that one. Good question. Um, firstly, I would say that. If there are concerns, I would, if you feel comfortable, talk to the organisation, talk to your HR, talk to somebody that you trust in the organisation, because we should never feel like we have to tolerate work or just survive at work. 
And if there are situations that people are turning a blind eye to that are potentially inhibiting your productivity, your emotions, it's and it's not just going to be you. If it's a manager, it could potentially be impacting a number of different people. So if you feel comfortable, be brave and to to talk to the to to your organization because change doesn't happen if you don't if you sit back and tolerate it. Um, so try to fight for it and and talk to somebody about it. Um, and I'd also like to say a second half of that is um, I get very similar questions about, you know, what if somebody refuses help or refuses to see something? And I always kind of end saying you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Sometimes you can do as much as you can to try and provide support, to try and speak up and and make changes. Um, but unfortunately, there are times where it's not necessarily something that that can be managed. But for an organisational perspective, if that happens and continues to happen, that's when you get higher instances of sickness absences, higher staff turnover, lack of productivity, customer service skills start decreasing. So, you know, it's really important for your organisation to take this seriously. I think it probably also links a little bit with, 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 with I think, probably the final question, which is the language used in um, one's performance monitoring and in general by management can impact negatively. Words such as falling short, not performing. What could be done about this? Now, if you're trying to help a manager change their ways, then maybe using different language yourself might be helpful, but may, maybe that's not, not right. Ellis, what do you think? I entirely agree. And I have heard um, some very interesting performance management reviews in my time. Um, language is important. The power of words can can really make or break um, a conversation um, and leave people feeling valued or completely um, unmotivated and, and actually um, withdraw from the organisation. Um, the best way to combat that is training okay mm -hmm. because sometimes people aren't necessarily aware of the words that they might use um, and how people could perceive it um, and often people go through management skills without necessarily sorry go through their management um, careers without necessarily having training or skills on how to provide return to works or provide to um, a um, uh, a staff performance of uh, uh, staff, staff performance um i've lost my words staff performance review uh, maybe review thank you <laughs> um so yes training is is really important um and and is the best way to make sure that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet and that everybody gets fair treatment as well yeah, I think so. Um, very simple one just in the chat. Do you have any example of engagement surveys or any ones that you know are particularly good or have used yourself? Um, I, as a business psychologist, I design my own um, as a case by case because organisations are very different. So you can get there's there's companies out there that do generic ones, but it, it will only provide you with generic responses and um, not necessarily target what it is that you need. Um, so yeah, I, I would encourage you to consider having one written for your organisation, which then is reused. So, you know, it's one cost that is then reused um, and minimal changes might be needed down the line. But, you know, it provides you with that flexibility of, of your own core needs. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I, I would encourage you to, to consider that. But there are numbers. Um, a number of different ones that you can can find online okay um oh i've, I've just got a, a a question are there any questions you can't ask due to data protection um i mean my view, the data yeah, i was going to say and i think it's the honesty yeah. but allowing people to be anonymous too i think you'll often get a more honest answer won't you um sometimes an, an honest anonymous answer is better than a than, than oh, a, yes. a known I would other one. always do anonymous staff surveys because you know there is almost no point in in uh, not having it anonymous because you will not get people's true feelings. Um, and in terms of data protection, you you know the staff surveys 
aren't compulsory. So um, you start off at all your surveys inviting people to provide this information and it's anonymous and um, you ex you explain what's going to happen with the data and then um, uh, and then it should be deleted once you've got the results that you've needed. Um, so if you want to ask me questions about um, data, then then I'd be happy to help there. That's brilliant, um, Ellis. I think, um, I mean, I've written down quite a lot of things. Um, one of the things I really liked about your, your, I mean, it's very close to my heart, is all the, the movement you were doing before um, before presenting today. Yes. I mean, I quite often, when people are being talking about back-to-back -back meetings, I say, if you call a meeting, you know, you're responsible for that meeting. So set time aside for either a little bit of activity before people start or a bit of mindfulness or something like that. You know, you know, if, you, if you've called a meeting, you you you've got you can almost set the tone can't you which is which is interesting so um thank you for sharing that with us um the other thing that came through a lot in the chat was there was a lot of thing about a lot of positivity about having a flexible working policy um you know that reflects and very much what you were saying about the culture of the organization so you can have a policy that supports people sets boundaries for people within their own business and so i think a, a lot of people will be going away and thinking about that so very that's great very good. Brilliant. All right, Ellis, thank you very much. Can I just remind all our all our viewers that we have our next webinar on May the 19th, and we're going to be looking at how to ensure healthy uh, DSC use and you know, computer usage, particularly in the hybrid uh, world. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, and apart from that, remind us that the recording of this webinar will be on our website. And a big thank you once again to Ellis. Thank you very much for your top tips. And um, we'll see you again soon. So thank you, everybody. And goodbye.